This is Jeff Portnoy, a member of the Ninth Circuit Historical Society, and I am pleased and proud today to have the opportunity of interviewing Judge Mark Bennett, Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, as we continue with our oral history project. Aloha, Jeff. Hello, Mark. How are you? Great. Well, I was looking for things we might have in common. There were some that I really don't think we probably should talk about. <laughs> But we were both born in Brooklyn. We uh, we we were uh, we were both we were both uh, we were both born in Brooklyn, and my guess is we were probably both bar mitzvahed. Uh, yes, yes, yes. I'm a little bit older than you, but uh, born in Brooklyn and uh, married. Yes. Wife. Um, yes. Uh, uh, Pat O'Hara and I in December will be uh, celebrating our 39th wedding anniversary. Congratulations, and I know Pat is an attorney. Pat, uh, Pat is, uh, is an attorney, and if I had a nickel for every time somebody told me I was lucky to be married to Pat, I would be rich. Pat is still looking for the first nickel. Well, let's talk a little bit about your pre-lawyer days. I know you went to Union College. Again, I was pretty close by. I went to Syracuse. And then a JD degree from Cornell, where you served on the Law Review. What kind of training do you think that you got on the law review that helps you now as a Ninth Circuit judge? I, I think that um, uh, a lot of experience with writing, trying to write uh, in a non-florid way, trying to do our best to convey the, uh, the ideas we had to uh, whether we were doing our own notes and comments or, or editing legal scholars, but with the emphasis always on the, it's about the ideas, not the author. What I found very interesting about the early days was that you came out here and clerked for Judge King, but you really didn't have any association at all with Hawaii at the time, correct? I, I, I didn't, and as I only semi-joke with people, the way I got here is for those who need additional circumstantial evidence of my bad character, that was it. Uh, I was almost certain there were money issues with the federal government at the time, but I was almost certain that that I had a job lined up at the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. who hired people right out of school because uh, we would start, as I did start, on the local side. And I really wanted a clerk for a federal district judge, but I wanted to be in, in a good location. And so the only places I applied for federal clerkships were Hawaii, Puerto Rico, and the Virgin Islands. And um, uh, I was just so fortunate that uh, Judge King and I really hit it off in our in our first interview. He was a mentor to me and then I was so fortunate that he became a friend and I met my wife through Judge King because she was an extern with him but the reason I came out here was because I was lucky enough that Judge King uh, hired me notwithstanding the extremely idiosyncratic nature of the places to which I applied. Well, of course, not only did you clerk for Judge King, but we'll get into later on when you came back into private practice in the U.S. Attorney's Office. I also had the privilege of appearing before Judge King many, many times. I know that you've told many people, including me while you were in practice, about the mentorship that he provided uh, coming from opposite sides of the world. What was it like uh, clerking for him, coming out of New York, having really no association with Hawaii, and of course Judge King, family had been here for quite some time, his father had been a territorial governor. What was that mesh like early on? It was, I, I mean, it was absolutely wonderful. Um, Judge King um, and uh, his wife, uh, the late Mrs. Ann King, really treated me from the very beginning like a member uh, of their family. But Judge King essentially knew everything there was to know about Hawaii. And although this is a, some hyperbole, only a little, he knew everyone. When Judge King and his clerks uh, would walk to lunch, uh, even if it was four blocks away downtown, it would take us 40 minutes because every single person on the street would, would stop and they and Judge King would talk story. And uh, 
but his history was amazing. His dad was a naval captain in China. Judge King was born in China. Judge King at a very, very young age became disabled. He lost an eye. And um, I mean, it's just hard, so hard to imagine having to go through life with that kind of a disability from such uh, a very young age. But Judge King did not let it stand in, in his way. Judge King was a Navy man. Uh, at least one of his brothers was a Navy man too. And that's sort of how he met Mrs. King, that uh, Judge King was a Japanese linguist. Mrs. King from the East Coast, I think she went to Smith, was a Japanese ling linguist, and they met at uh, some version of Naval Intelligence School during World War II, and uh, because of the Japanese language, the way Judge King would tell the story was that within a week of meeting Mrs. King, he knew that this was the woman for him, and he immediately proposed, but it took her a year to say yes. You didn't serve on the district court bench, and we'll talk a little bit about your career. You went to the circuit court bench. Does your time, even though it was decades ago with Judge King and the way that he interacted with clients, with attorneys, staff, does that still impact you as you sit on the circuit court bench and you review decisions of, of the district court? Absolutely. Um, and uh, uh, I mean, Judge King was the best judge in the world. And just, I know I will never be as good a judge as Judge King was, but to have the level of Judge King's quality of judging and the way he treated people as something to hold out as an ideal to strive for is extremely valuable. But I also don't lose sight of one of the very first things that I heard Judge King would say at a hearing. It was um, a preliminary injunction hearing. When we're offline, I'll let you know who the players were. But an attorney whose name I will not mention was based, said to Judge King, I was in court as the crier, you know, Judge King, if you rule the way you say you're going to, you're going to get reversed by the Ninth Circuit. Um, never a good thing to tell a judge, but Judge King laughed and he said, you may be right, Mr. So-and-so, but my record on appeal is a heck of a lot better than theirs is, although he didn't say heck. Um, and uh, so, you know, I, I think one needs to be careful of hubris. One needs to have humility, even though one is reviewing the decisions of our district court colleagues, because we know there's another court that's reviewing our decisions. And uh, Judge King always tried to do what was right. Uh, that's what I and my colleagues try to do. But we all know we're not infallible, as the Supreme Court uh, tells our circuit uh, uh, very frequently. So you clerked for Judge King, and then you did go back to Washington, D.C. and join the U.S. Attorney's Office, spent a little bit of time there, and then did you transfer out here or get transferred? to the U.S. Attorney's Office here in Honolulu? I, I was there, um, and it was a wonderful office, uh, because basically all we did for my first lengthy rotation there was just try cases, and it was so much fun. All jury trials, and 80 to 90 percent of the time, the first time we saw the case file was when we hit the courtroom to pick the jury, because we were trying other people's cases. and. Um, uh, I, I know, Jeff, that would be something you would have loved to do. It was something I loved to do. And, I, and kind of, if, you, if that looks to someone as, oh my God, that's terrible, then probably they're not destined to be a trial lawyer. But I, I came out here, my, my wife Pat and I were living in DC. She had a legal job with the United States. Um, but we came back here after I'd been in DC for a few years to get sworn into the bar. And I had lunch when I was here, we came back for a week. And um, while well, Pat was getting sworn into the bar and Dan Bent, 
who had been the head of the organized crime strike force when I was a law clerk, had become the U.S. attorney. Uh, we had lunch, and he said, Mark, um, as, as you know, we've got four, sometimes five assistants. We can go 10, 15 years without a vacancy. Um, interested in transferring. And uh, I had said, um, you, know, you know, Dan, I would be very interested, but I have a temporal commitment in the district. And uh, I believe Dan said, well, you know, I took the liberty of first talking to the U.S. attorney. And um, they, if you wanted to come back here, um, they would, um, there wouldn't be any kind of a problem. And so I discussed it with Pat, discussed it with uh, my then future in-laws and decided that this was an opportunity that might not come for a long time. So uh, very happily, was very happy to get the offer from U.S. Attorney Bent, took it and stayed at the U.S. Attorney's office here for uh, about nine, uh, well, about, about seven and a half years, was, about nine in total. Was there a particular emphasis in the law that you specialized in at the U.S. Attorney's office? Well. Um, uh, this will sound kind of funny, but we were a small office with a big caseload. I did all the violent crime uh, because we have so many federal reservations. So probably in my time at the U.S. Attorney's Office, I probably prosecuted 10 murder cases, um, but did a lot of violent crime. But we didn't have divisions, so we did all our own appeals, and Dan wanted to let people do the kind of civil work they were interested in. He said, Mark, do you have anything? Um, I, I know you really haven't practiced civil law because you weren't doing that for the most part at the U.S. Attorney's Office in D.C. So uh, is there an area where, where you would like to develop some expertise? And I said, I said, yes, I would love to do med mal cases because, uh, as you know, Jeff, uh, Triple Army Medical Center is here and like with any other large hospital, there are a fair amount of med mal cases that come out of Tripler. So for the entire time I was here, um, I defended a lot of med mal cases. And when I went into private practice, both at my first firm uh, and my second firm, I did a number of those. And what was, what was pretty fascinating for me is this, as you know, being in essence a small town. Um, I was able to actually do both sides of med mal in private practice. So I did occasional plaintiff's cases and uh, some of the, uh, at that time, med mal insurers who did the vast majority of the writing uh, from time to time would hire me to, to do defense work on med mal. So I did a whole bunch of tripler cases and um, uh, that helped me with developing that aspect of my practice. So in 1991, you joined the McCorston Miller Mackay firm, which was new. Yes. Uh, I know that because Bill asked me to join it initially, and I declined. Maybe the right choice, maybe not. But you joined the firm, which was just getting started under under Bill McCorston, who was even then one of the most well-respected mm -hmm. trial lawyers in town and has remained as such. And you were there for for quite some time. Yes. The nature of your practice then was all civil, wasn't it? With an occasional white collar case. It was, thrown well, in. with, yes, with one footnote. Um, people take different approaches to pro bono work. Uh, all pro bono work was important. I did some traditional pro bono work, but uh, I, I think part of my pro bono aspect was a little bit unique. Uh, I, I don't think this has ever happened in Hawaii before, but there were two murder cases that I prosecuted pro bono, one for the attorney general, one for the city prosecutor. When the city prosecutor and the attorney general had a conflict of interest, I pro bono prosecuted both those murder cases, including what to my knowledge is uh, even today, thankfully, Hawaii's only Crip blood murder case. And then obviously you were a man looking for other opportunities, having been through a federal clerkship, U.S. Attorney's Office, private practice, and you had a wonderful private practice career. You and I had the pleasure of working together on a number of cases. Absolutely. Occasionally on opposite sides.
but then the government kept calling, and uh, you served two consecutive terms as attorney general. Yes. Uh, in Hawaii, unlike almost all states, I believe in 42 or 43 states, the attorney general is an elected position. In Hawaii, it's an appointed position subject to confirmation by the state senate. And I was just very fortunate that Governor Linda Lingle, who was our uh, first Republican governor since statehood, uh, and I was a Republican as well, uh, she asked me if I would be interested in being attorney general. And although the job struck me as wonderful. Uh, I, I wasn't actually able to immediately tell Governor Lingle yes, because what I said to, to Governor Lingle was yes, but, which is I first have to talk to the State Ethics Commission, because if my wife would be required to quit her job as a Deputy Attorney General, I would not take the job. Um, and fortunately, the Ethics Commission um, said, as long as you don't directly supervise your wife uh, in terms of personnel type issues. And I think my comment to the then head of the Ethics Commission was, if even aside from your saying that, I was stupid enough to make personnel decisions for my wife, then I would definitely be the wrong choice to be anybody's attorney general. But because that was not a problem, um, I happily accepted the job from Governor Lingle. And I was, I was very proud that e even in occasionally partisan times, I was twice unanimously confirmed as attorney general by, uh, by the state senate. Our lives have some parallel in that regard as well, because in a subsequent administration, I was asked to become attorney general. And meeting with the governor, uh, we talked it over for quite some time. The reason I bring it up is I was a somewhat successful trial attorney, as you were. You were probably a more successful. I don't know about event, that. In any event. Uh, we were both, I think, earning nice salaries, and at the time, more, much more than the attorney general position would pay. But I remember the governor said this to me, and I'm bringing it up only because I want to ask you whether this ended your decisions to take the job. The governor said, look, Jeff, he said, you're in the prime of your career. You've done about everything you need to do as a private attorney. And 50 years from now, no one will even remember who you were. But if you become attorney general, people will know 50 years from now what you did and why you did it. And it was very convincing. I didn't take the job. But you did. And, and tell me why you left a lucrative, successful private practice to go into public service. I, I, I guess, I, I mean, this is going to sound self-serving, the start. But the fact that when I took the job, I think the, the AG salary was literally, it, it, it went up after that, but it was literally like 80 grand. And, you know, when you're taking- You were making more of them, of course, than I believe. I, 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 I think I probably took like an 80, 90% pay cut. But regardless, um, uh, honestly, the thing that attracted me beyond um, the wonderful department, which I knew because I'd been a part of the AG family for so many decades because of my wife being a deputy, um, was that, and again, going back to an early theme for those who need it, more circumstantial evidence of my bad character, I knew that there was no one who could tell me ever that there would be any particular case as attorney general that I couldn't handle myself. No one could tell me that. Nobody had the power to do that. And um, so the, the idea with the varied work that the state AG did, both civil and criminal, that um, I, I could do so many of these, I could supervise so many of these interesting cases and then just go to court, uh, argue the cases on appeal myself when appropriate, that just was so intellectually challenging. And something that I always felt very strongly about as a lawyer, but also as a government lawyer, the importance of federalism. 
And at the time I became attorney general, um, again, a little bit of hyperbole, but, but not much. The U.S. District Court for the District of Hawaii was running two large state departments. It was running the Department of Education because of very serious special education problems that the state had had, and also um, with the Civil Rights Division of DOJ was running the state hospital. And I felt that under the Cayetano administration, um, which was before we came in, there had been enough progress made that the state should now be running its own departments. And I made it a priority, and it was important to me to do this, to try to get those two departments back to the state to run. And fortunately, I was able to succeed in that. But there were so many things like that every day, so many challenging things. I'd had a strong uh, law enforcement background. Um, and, and I believed that courts are there to interpret the organic document of the jurisdiction. Courts are there to interpret the Constitution, but the choice of whether to amend the Constitution is the people's. And so I also made it as a priority to sponsor, and there were ultimately four that got passed, state constitutional amendments in the law enforcement arena because I thought that was part of our system of government and the, the ability to do things like that as attorney general just was so attractive to me. Um, there was never a thought of mine that this wasn't a wonderful job but for the, the one issue that I had to deal with, with my wife and ethics. And of course, people who know the politics in Hawaii know that it was a very interesting time when you served as Attorney General under a Republican governor, which was unheard of. I think at the time there might have been how many? Five Republicans the, in the legislature? Were, so what was it like for eight years representing a Republican governor in a state which was 95% Democrat? It, 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 was, it was great. It really was because um, the, the vast majority of the legislators I got along with very well. And we understood each other. And occasionally we had to, to use a euphemism, reason together. Um, but basically for what I considered to be the really good legislators, they knew that there were issues that they and I would never agree on. Something, one of my failures as attorney general for eight years, I tried to get the state rules of evidence amended to put in the federal expert witness Daubert rules in, and I failed every single year. But we recognized there were things we were never going to agree on, but that didn't stop any of us. Um, and actually at my confirmation process, Senator Schatz commented about this from the time that he was in the House, that we were still able to recognize we can put those to the side and come to agreement on things that we did agree on, that we were not going to, none of us were going to say, well, we can't agree on this, so we're going to agree on nothing. And uh, both in the civil justice arena and the criminal arena, I, I think we were able to agree on some, some wonderful, wonderful things that helped Hawaii because we were trying to find areas of agreement, not areas of disagreement. Well, you bring up your confirmation process, and I found it fascinating researching it yesterday. Uh, you know, Judge Clifton decided to go senior, and and you were nominated by President Trump. Uh, your vote in the Senate was 72 to 27. And most people would think, oh, well, 27 Democrats must have voted against Mark Bennett, nominated by Trump, a Republican. All 27 votes were Republicans who were against you because you had supported Hawaii's restrictive firearms. Tell me about how that all process worked. <laughs> well, it, it was it, it was interesting because um, uh, when President Trump was elected, uh, I was too old for an Article Three position. Nobody puts people put people my age in an Article Three position, and I applied to be the U.S. Attorney 
in Hawaii, and our two senators wanted to uh, come to an agreement with President Trump on the Ninth Circuit, the U.S. Attorney, and the District Court. And they were able to agree, I was told, on me as the U.S. Attorney and uh, on Judge Otake for the District Court, but they could not agree on the Ninth Circuit. And even though I'd had a really good interview with Attorney General Sessions for U.S. Attorney, just nothing was moving forward because they wanted to agree on all three. And one day I got a call from someone who had been my former law partner, a friend of mine who was the chief of staff for one of the senators. Um, and um, we, we have similar senses of humor. And he called me and he said, Mark, as you know, the senators want to try to uh, come to a full agreement with uh, President Trump. And we can't agree on the Ninth Circuit. President Trump has sent us every single one of his good names, and none of them work for the senators. The senators have sent President Trump every single one of their good names. None of them work for President Trump. So having gone through all of the good names, the senators asked me to give you a call. But. Um, but yes, uh, as Hawaii Attorney General, I had signed on to amicus briefs doing what I thought was the right thing, uh, uh, signing on to amicus briefs that I thought were justified by the law, but in the interest of my client, which was the state of Hawaii, and there were two um, of particular interest in the confirmation process. One, I was one of the very few attorneys general, Democrat or Republican, who signed on to New York's amicus brief in support of the District of Columbia in, in the Heller case. And one of the interesting aspects of that brief was, well, you know, the District of Columbia is not a state. So even if you are going to rule against the District of Columbia, you don't have to rule that the Second Amendment is incorporated so it applies to the states, because of course the district would be covered um, by uh, by other things. Uh, but Hawaii had very restrictive gun laws and this, uh, and, and Heller going the other way, at least as to incorporation was in the interests of Hawaii. We also had some of the most restrictive campaign finance uh, laws in the country. And I also signed on to an amicus brief that um, uh, the position of which was rejected in Citizens United. And there were a number of Republican senators who felt that my signing off on those amicus briefs meant that I would not be the kind of Ninth Circuit judge uh, that they would want to vote for. And I actually was told by somebody uh, who was helping me from the Department of Justice. The Department of Justice helps judicial nominees. They, they said, uh, to our knowledge, you are the first person in the history of the Republic that was confirmed to an Article Three position where a majority of the president's party voted against you. <laughs> I found that fascinating. Well, let's talk for a few minutes about your time on the Ninth Circuit. There are two cases, I think, that, that gave you early prominence. I mean, you've only been on the bench for a few years. Um, you were in the majority in 2019, uh, blocking the asylum restrictions by Trump in the Ninth Circuit, but not nationwide. And of course, that was such a controversial political issue at the time. What was it like kind of being a, a new judge and being in such an important case of national significance? Well, I, I think what we did in that case on a motions panel was basically um, we said uh, these things that there are some issues with nationwide injunctions. And that's a really big discussion. But um, I, I mean, it was, it was certainly uh, very interesting. And although I was fortunate enough in my practice with the types of cases I had, with a couple of major exceptions, like I really didn't do immigration cases or social security disability cases, which we see a lot of, I'd seen a lot of constitutional issues and other things. But I had never really had to deal with nationwide injunctions, and so it was uh, it, it was it was very interesting. We had a uh, robust discussion uh, about uh, about the case. But um, the the one of the many wonderful things about this job is every day 
you see a new interesting legal issue and it's just one of the many parts of the job that I love. The other case I want to briefly mention is in 2021 and it comes out of COVID and you declined to halt the San Diego Unified School District's requirements that students be vaccinated and that was another extraordinarily complicated and uh, political case that had ramifications throughout the country. Well, I mean, COVID has been a tragedy for the whole country. There's been a lot of litigation. I was recently, I recently wrote an opinion this year on another aspect of COVID. Um, uh, and we didn't halt what San Diego did. But what I will say, just to put it in context, although the Supreme Court did not grant cert um, uh, from those who lost, uh, because of subsequent events that didn't really impact the merits, um, in their decision um, not taking the case, the, the Supreme Court, um, or at least a, a significant number of the justices of the Supreme Court, made it clear that they were, shall I say, not signing on to the decision of the majority in the Ninth Circuit. Let me ask you a question about the job. Rick, Rick Lipton, of course, was my former partner, and we've stayed close, and you know we try to get together every several months. And from the beginning, Rick, like you, frankly, is a very social person. You like to be out meeting people. You like the banter of trial work, and being in a courtroom, and the give and take. Rick's one complaint to me of being on the Ninth Circuit was its isolation. He said, I'm spending most of my time in my office talking to clerks and you know, maybe writing an opinion. Occasionally we'll you know, listen to oral argument, but I don't have the interaction that I, I really loved, not only with my partners, but with, with attorneys. Did, did that isolation ever impact you as you became a, an appellate court judge? I wouldn't say the isolation, but sort of a related aspect. Uh, I am sure you are familiar with the old canard that even after racehorses retired, uh, if, their, if their stable was near Keeneland or, uh, or, or near Arlington, when they heard the call to the post, sometimes their ears still pick, perked up. And um, all, although at one point my wife essentially said to me, enough already. Um, I would read something in the paper um, and I would say some version of, wow, if I was still in private practice, this would be a case that I would be doing. And um, I, I do have to say, I missed being in court on the other side of the bench. I missed, I, I loved, and I'm sure you did too, I loved talking to juries. I thought the genius of the jury system um, it is just the common sense and juries so, so very often get it right. And I loved trying cases in front of juries. I did miss that. Um, but there are so many things that make up for it. Uh, wonderful collegial colleagues, although the Ninth Circuit has a reputation of um, large disagreements disagreements among the judges. We are a very collegial court personally. I had heard that before I got on the court. I'm not sure I believed it before I got on the court, but it's absolutely true. And uh, that's wonderful. Uh, maybe the best thing about the being on the court is I have one career law clerk, but who is just a joy. Uh, she was my former colleague at my last law firm but three brilliant new young people every year. And just a joy to be able to work with, with brilliant, very young, in context lawyers. So many great things about the job. Not getting to try cases in context is a minor loss. And although the years occasionally still perk up, a little bit less, or at least maybe a lot less than what I got on the bench. Well, finally, even though you've been a West Coast boy now for decades, 
you haven't lost your love for some of the East Coast, and you must be going through a very difficult time with both your New York Yankees and your New York football giants. I, I am. It is, it is true. The Yankees right now, the, the summer of 2023, this is probably the worst team they've had in close to 40 years. And uh, the Giants have been going through a, a difficult stretch. But um, I still have the joy of, uh, I saw the Giants win one Super Bowl in person. I saw the Yankees uh, win three World Series uh, in person, although I also saw them lose two World Series. Uh, and I have those wonderful memories. And uh, one of the great things about it, too, was that on some of those occasions, my wife was with me. So I am hopeful that this, too, will pass. Well, Judge Mark Bennett, it's been a pleasure talking with you. And it's been a pleasure knowing you all these years. Thanks for your time. Jeff. Um, Great, great interviewer. Um, people are going to listen to this and they're going to say, the interviewer was great, <laughs> but, but thank you very much. And thanks to the wonderful Ninth Circuit Historical Society. Thank you.